All right, welcome back to Computer Science E259. Uh, my name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 3, DOM Level 3. What we will try to do in this class, before typically diving ahead into something completely new, is take a quick look back at where we've come from, just so that we can contextualize the newest material, particularly since it usually builds upon the previous week. So, with that said, this, if you may or may not recall, is what we did last time. Let's see if we can pluck a few of these off the list. Um, in one sentence, tell me something interesting about XML. It's extensible. <laughs> okay, so we got the X. Tell me one other interesting thing about XML. Yeah? Don't say markup. <laughs> Okay, so you can make up your own tags. And so as we said last week, it's sort of a language out of which you can write other languages. And that's sort of a strange statement for us to make perhaps now, but starting next week when we dive into a language called XSLT, which itself is entirely written in XML, that notion of XML being the language in which other languages are written will begin to make more sense. It's not entirely just a language a markup language for marking up the data, as we've seen in some of our representative documents. What about SACS? First, what does it stand for? Not because acronyms are interesting, but because it perhaps explains what it does. Yeah, so simple API for XML, which simply means it's one of the perhaps most popular or certainly most straightforward uh, programming interfaces via which you can get at XML data. And just in a nutshell, how does SACS work? Perfect. So it fires events when it comes across interesting stuff. So in other words, you've got a what we would call a SACS parser, and a SACS parser would typically take one or two inputs, like the file name to parse, and then some kind of event handler or object containing event handlers. We called this, what, last time, that interface in the world of Java? So-called something handler. Event handler in general, but the specific interface that JAXP uses was called content handler. So we pass to the SAX parser or content handler and the file itself, and then as you note, it just goes through that file, top to bottom, left to right, and every time it encounters something interesting, it fires an event. What does that mean? Well, it triggers an event to be called, invoked, and you presumably, by way of that content handler, have sort of told the parser what method it should invoke to deal with that interesting something. What were the kinds of interesting somethings that could be encountered in an XML document? that SACS informs us of? Attributes. So uh, attributes, so let's take one step higher. So in the context of elements, it'll say start elements, and here's the element's name and attributes. What else is interest? Sorry? End element. End element. Start document, end document, characters. characters, and there are actually a few others which we haven't focused on so much, but they're more of the uh, comments, C data, although C data falls under the domain of characters, but entities and that sort of thing. Um, JAXP itself, so we just made mention of it. This is the Java API for XML processing, and this really just refers to those several dozens of classes that we've looked at in the Sun Java doc that sort of itself collectively define all of the uh, code available to you with the JDK uh, that relates to XML. And we've been using this in project one, or you will be using this in project one, for a relatively small part of it, the tail end of the project, where you actually use Xerxes, or that is to say, a SACS parser to achieve a particular goal. And henceforth, in the course, you will be using real, that is, um, you know, industry standard XML parsers, not so much at the command line, not so much by typing up the Java code that invokes those methods yourself, but by way of other tools that we'll be using. So more on that in the weeks to come. Xerxes itself is just a specific implementation of a, uh, what it means to be an, it is an XML parser, and that's, recall, what's bundled with the JDK. Parsing, we talked about in general what it is. Now that you've presumably spent a bit of time on Project One, you yourselves had a, a taste of what it is and what it sort of means to parse a document. And then we concluded last week by looking at Project One. The representative document that we looked at was this. It's representative because there are what sorts of features in this document? There's elements. What else was sort of noteworthy? So attributes, sorry, values of attributes, sorry, C data, character data, comments up top, the XML declaration, the doc type declaration, uh, processing instruction perhaps, and just a bit of trivia, C data section is interesting for what reason or equivalently why would you use it? Uh, I wouldn't say interpolate. It doesn't get 
parsed itself. It really is just read in as one big chunk, and which is to say it's a safe place to include things like markup or HTML markup, JavaScript markup perhaps, if this is a XML document that's being used to download perhaps. <laughs> Wow, for those of you not here, a huge amount of snow just fell off the roof. <laughs> it's more interesting than XML. <laughs> so, so it's not parsed, and we'll see over the course of the semester why that's sometimes useful, but I'll caution now that it, it can very easily become a lazy man's tool to avoid doing things perhaps a better way, so it is not the first solution you should typically think of when trying to communicate data by XML. This, recall, was an abbreviated list of the SACS events that we looked at and as well as that you're playing with with Project One. So what are we up to tonight? So last week we looked at one programmatic interface by way of SACS. Well, tonight is the second of two major APIs, namely DOM. This stands for Document Object Model. And whereas SACS is really sort of a quick and dirty API to XML, a fire and forget API, as we concluded with last week, DOM represents XML how? as a tree object, literally as a hierarchical tree where pretty much every element in your XML document is ultimately represented with what's called a node in that tree. And we'll see tonight there are different types of nodes, there are different characteristics of these nodes, and though this too is somewhat of a low-level detail, especially as in this course and really in the real world, you would typically use off-the-shelf tools that use these APIs, perhaps more than you would use the APIs themselves, increasingly common, actually, is it to use the DOM API even in web-type development. AJAX, recall, asynchronous JavaScript and XML is sort of the, the new and sexy API that a lot of websites are using in order to give the user a much more dynamic experience. Google Maps is sort of the canonical example of a website where there's really only one web page, but everything happens within the confines of that page, and everything's actually going on behind the scenes without that page itself ever reloading? Well, one of the means by which you can manipulate content, even in a web page today, is by way of the DOM API. We're going to focus on it in this class by way of its Java implementation in JAXP, but there exists implementations of DOM effectively in JavaScript. And not the most beautiful of languages, but it is the language that is used in a lot of web scripting and in AJAX itself. So realize that these skills translate to some really sexy web-oriented development uh, type uh, features as well. Um, we'll look again at JAXP and Xerxes because we'll look at the, uh, their DOM uh, take on JAXP and we'll also take a look at my first XML parser again and I'll also give you a quick demo of how to submit your work and some of the logistical things that you might be wondering, especially if you've been developing on your local machine. So let's begin first though with the who cares question, right, before we just blindly move on to new material just because it exists. DOM. Who cares? We already have an API for XML, SACS. It seems to work. You've probably been using it yourselves. What might we say are some of the shortcomings of SACS? Yeah, you look at the data once and then it sort of passes you by, which could be a good thing. But as we, even one of the questions in the project one asks you to consider, there is many different scenarios that you can imagine. All of them are pretty reasonable in which it's not a good thing to have these events fired and then forgotten, where you actually want to be able to manipulate the data, maybe move things around or perform computations or manipulations of data, not one after the other after the other in the order in which they appear, but just arbitrarily. Like you might pull records from a database. You don't want to have to necessarily do all of your database manipulations you know, in the real world going from the first row all the way to the bottom, you'd like to be able to pull out arbitrary pieces of data. And SACS doesn't really allow you to do that. You could hack around it, certainly, right? SACS is just an API, which means if you wanted to keep around in an array or a linked list some sort of history of all of the events you've seen, all of the um, elements you've seen, and all of their attributes, by all means, you can do so. But that's sort of why there exist other APIs. And in fact, the DOM API, as you'll see in Project One, can be built on top of the SACS API, rather than simply doing something uh, like printing the pseudocode for a SACS event to the screen. Well, maybe when you receive an event, a start element event, why not instantiate a node, call it an element, and then proceed with any future start element calls to just append nodes to the bottom of that? And if you can sort of visualize that idea of instantiating nodes for each start element event and just tacking on subsequent events as nodes beneath that, what you effectively have is 
a tree. And that's exactly how you'll implement your DOM builder in project one out of SAX events. So the SAX API does have some advantages, we'll say, and they're enumerated here. But again, a lot of these should be intuitive if you just consider what SACS itself offers. It is quick and dirty. It's pretty, it's pretty efficient. Doesn't really waste any memory because as soon as it uses the memory, it then moves on to the next element and doesn't keep anything around. So it's certainly useful for large documents. Right? Terseness and XML markup is of what? Quote from last week, two weeks ago. Minimal importance. Right, so XML documents in theory could be large, though there certainly comes a point where you have to ask yourself, is XML even the right format to be doing what I'm doing if I'm trying to process megabytes or gigabytes of information? That in and of itself is an interesting question. But certainly when you are faced with either data coming in off the wire or simply a large data set, the, thing, the API that uses the least amount of resources is perhaps an API of choice. But it doesn't solve every problem, and we've pretty much addressed these kinds of problems verbally. So enter the document object model. Well, let's take a look at this example document, pretty similar to what we did last week, and consider what it would mean to actually use DOM, that is to represent this document as a tree. Well, just to sort of spoil the fun of walking through this node by node, there's an answer. I'll give you a moment to sort of absorb it. But I'll point out slowly some of the salient features of this thing, which include, which include one, so the document node. So we have that notion of start document. Well, similarly in DOM, is there a notion of the root of the tree, which though um, somewhat confusingly named, is not the root of your, your root element of your XML document. The document node is one step above that because the root element of this document would be called what? students, right? So that's actually the, one of the children of the document. But that sort of makes sense if above the root element, what kinds of things can you have in an XML document? XML declaration. Well, sure. So we just saw it in one of our earlier documents. You've got the XML declaration and doc type, though those themselves aren't represented at the top of the DOM necessarily, as you might expect. Um, but processing instructions or comments, certainly. In fact, here we have a comment, which similarly is at the same level, so to speak as the root element, so you need this sort of uber node to hang on to everything, a pointer to everything else, if you will. So some of the interesting things to point out is that it looks like DOM is sort of a hybrid between what's a tree, an n -ary tree, but also linked lists. In other words, whereas the document itself is hierarchical and grows vertically, well, whenever you have attributes, just the model sort of depicts those, though so you can think of these in any manner you wish, sort of grows the tree horizontally. That is to say, attributes get strung off um, horizontally, conceptually, but the tree itself grows vertically. So what does this mean? Well, each and every one of these rectangles on the screen here is what we call a node, a node, quite simply. But there can be different types of nodes. One of these is an element node. Another is a comment node. Another is a text node. Um, and we also have what's called an attribute node. Of these, a little random trivia as we proceed, and which of these would it not make conceptual sense for children to be allowed? Comments can't really have children conceptually because you can't nest comments, we, we've said, and, and attributes too. So that's why pictorially we sort of um, string these things across elements laterally instead of below just to convey the notion that these are sort of linked lists of attributes rather than nodes descending from some child. So let's see some of this apart. Um, this is a recap pretty much of the definition we just enumerated. So, um, and this too, we've sort of addressed already. So it, the, the thing about DOM and the way in which it's defined in the recommendation or in the spec is that it's entirely language and platform neutral. So it's written in a, an intermediate language of sorts that is, can be implemented in any number of languages including JavaScript, and Java, we in this course tend to dwell on the Java aspect of it. But it is a higher notion than something Java specific. So what is it, what's its relationship to what we've already seen? Well, I too kind of spoiled the fun there. Right? It's not hard to imagine probably how you might, at least on a high level, go about building a tree like that out of SACS events. 
In other words, scrolling back, what's the first, ele what's the first SACS event that gets triggered upon processing a well-formed XML document? Start document. So just in you know, English terms, what would you do in your start document event handler when it's called? Create a new node, right? Instantiate with Java's new operator, to put it in Java context, a new node of type document, and then just hang on to it somehow, right? How do you hold on to a tree in any data structures type program? Well, you just hang on to the root element, and from there you can reach everything else. So what is perhaps the next SACS event to be fired when processing an XML document? In this case, or in the general, so start element, in this case maybe comment, but sure, start element. So if you have start element, well conceptually what do you need to do? You're probably, as one of you said earlier, going to instantiate an element node. And so long as you've kept track of the last node you've instantiated, and you have some way of appending children to it, and the DOM API specifies what the methods would be called to append a child to a node, well, you've already got a pointer to the root, the root of the document. You've just instantiated a new element, so you simply add this guy as a child of this guy. What, uh, hmm? sorry. I'm sorry, I just a Sure. student, these two text notes here. So an excellent question, actually. So just to be clear, we're looking first at the students element, which is here. And it appears, according to the DOM, that students has how many children? It looks like three. So one, two, three. So this one's obvious, right? Student is clearly a child of students. But where does this text node and this text node come? Well, again, as we've emphasized uh, last week and also in the project spec, if you don't have a D, what's called a DTD or schema, all white space outside of tags should be considered uh, significant. And so what does that mean? Well, it turns out that there's a new line character there, backslash n, and probably a backslash t here, or a couple of spaces. And then similarly, then we have this element, but this is all inside the student element. But as soon as the student element's tag ends, then we have another backslash n. So that's its second child. So and one of the curious things that you should realize when using the real APIs for SACS and or DOM is that, one, SACS does not guarantee that you will have a characters event fired for all contiguous characters. Which is to say, if we parse this XML document with a SACS parser, you know, an off-the-shelf implementation like Xerxes, it's possible, though not necessarily common, that the parser would call for this node a characters event with backslash n, followed by a characters event with backslash t, which is one of these sort of nuisances of programming at the very lowest level of SACS, because then you really have to keep track in your own sort of memory, in your own implementation, of all of these contiguous characters, potentially. Turns out with DOM, though, even if you build a DOM out of SACS events, that a DOM upon construction is supposed to be what's called normalized, which means any adjacent characters nodes, or text nodes, rather, are supposed to be concatenated together so that you have just one text node, whereas in SACS you might have multiple characters events. In other words, this is correct. It would be incorrect if we called this a normalized DOM but had two text nodes, one with backslash n, one with backslash t. Yeah. One follow-up question. Sure. Is there any significance to the fact A good question. Is there any significance of the fact that these two text nodes are at the same level as students? And the answer is yes, absolutely, because they're at the same they're meant to be at the same level of the tree. Because again, if we consider this example, what we have here is the beginning of the student's element. Well, what kinds of children can an element have? It can have mixed content, it can have empty content, it can have element content, or text content. Well, in this case, we have mixed content, because we have some white space characters and elements. So the first chunk of content that we have is this backslash n and this backslash t. So that's one child. But this element, student, is conceptually at the same level. Because the only time we begin a new level of the tree is when we begin a new element. So that's why the student does begin a new level of the tree. But text nodes, that is character events, would not trigger a new level to the tree. <laughs>
Good question. Yeah. Correct, but notice which one this is referring to. So because this text node appears to have the value backslash n backslash t backslash t, and it's the first child of student, what that's referring to is specifically this backslash n and the two tab characters that are its first children. So this one over here? So this one here. That is this backslash n here. So it gets a little confusing. It's funny how you can get such complexity out of the simplest of examples, but useful information as you start using the API so that you know what to expect, certainly. But good questions, all of them. Others? No? Okay, so what's worth bearing in mind here? All right, so what's the relationship here? Just to use our little animation to hopefully make things slightly more clear. So the relationship we're going to have here is we are going to take an XML document, we're going to run it through a SAX parser, so, which is going to have its own content handler, and we're going to use that content handler to build a DOM. What we're effectively then depicting here is your implementation of what we call DOM Builder in Project 1. DOM Builder is a content handler that you are asked to pass to your own XML parser and build out of some of the sample files or any XML file that, your gra that our grammar um, is consistent with a DOM. Okay, so with that said, let's consider a simple document here. So we have the beginning of a document, so there's no characters yet that have been read per se, but start document gets called. Conceptually or visually, what should happen now in our model? Yeah, we should get a document node. Pretty boring, but pretty important because everything under that, uh, it, everything is going to hang beneath that node. All right, what might be next? All right, so we process a bunch of contiguous characters reading up to the close bracket, which at least in our simplified parser is sort of your uh, clue that you're at the end of something interesting in the document, and so we trigger what sax event? Yeah, so start element, no attributes. So out of this, we're going to instantiate a new node in our DOM, an element node, and provided we've been keeping track with some kind of reference in our content handler of the last node we created, we should know who the parent of this new node should be, so we create it and we attach it as a child of that node. The next thing we apparently encounter is some characters event, uh, or some contiguous characters, which I've drawn contiguously because it keeps things a little simpler. In the DOM then, what do we get next? What kind of node? It's called a text node. I don't know why it's called characters events in one and text node in the other, but that's what we're stuck with. So it's a text node. Where's it going to go? Under students. Under students. Because we've just begun an element, which we said earlier means we descend deeper into the tree to a new level. So we get a new text node there. All right. What we encounter next is another start of an element, which is student. This is a further simplified example. So this is an empty element. So what two sax events will be fired one after the other? Start element and end element. Well, what happens when start element is called with that attribute? Well, we're going to instantiate a new type of node, obviously an element node. Who does this become a child of? Students. Students. So realize whatever DOM building code we're walking ourselves through, or what you're going to implement in DOMBuilder.java, has to keep track of the fact that, yeah, you just instantiated a new node, but it was a text node, which means we don't plan to descend deeper. You keep your reference, your finger, so to speak, on the actual element node that can be a parent. All right, so we instantiate that new node, element. We need to string some attributes off of it, which will be uh, implemented, as you may have seen, by way of the atter object. And we'll come back to that later tonight. Um, now that we're inside the student element, what does that mean about where my finger should be, where my reference should be? Yeah, now it's going to be pointing to student, but not for long, because the next event to be fired, you said, was end element. Now, do we have to instantiate anything new when this is called? Not really. That wouldn't really make sense to instantiate anything new. So what programmatically should happen in my DOM builder? Perfect. So I'm going to need to move my finger from the node it's currently pointing at to whoever its parent node is. So hopefully in the DOM API and in our simplified API, there's a way to backtrack. That is, it's sort of a 
a doubly linked tree in both directions so that we can easily find the parent, so that we don't have to start from the root and search the whole tree, which would be kind of silly. All right, what might get fired next? Looks like we have another characters event to keep things a little pretty, and so we're going to instantiate a new text node at what level on the tree? Under students, plural, because we're outside of the student element, because end element was already called. Next fired is it looks like end element for the student's element. What does that mean for us in the DOM code? Yep. Finger is going to move from students back to its parent, which is document, which means we must be nearing the end. In fact, we um, are. We just encountered end students, end element students, end document gets called because we're out of XML content, presumably to parse in our XML parser, so that event gets fired. As soon as that happens over there, what do we do? Yeah, just nothing, really, right? Along the way, we might have to keep track of what event was just called so that if right after end document we get start element, we throw some kind of fatal error or exception because that conceptually does not fit the model, and so that would be a, that would be a parsing error. Right? And you've seen perhaps in the real API, there's different levels of parsing errors, like a warning, a fatal error. We only give you in project one the notion of a fatal error, since we don't really care so much about teasing apart the relative and significance of errors, but that would be an error. So you might have to keep track conceptually of where you are, what state you are. Well, what are the types of nodes that can be in DOM? Here's the biggest, and they're all familiar to you from the world of SACs. And what you'll notice again in project one is that there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of borrowing of names, and for whatever reason, there's a lot of inconsistencies as well. But same ideas, just implemented somewhat differently. And I've drawn them somewhat hierarchically like this to imply that all of these things, elements, atters, text, document, comments, they're all of type node. And so we're going to see in the real API some notion of polymorphism, some notion of inheritance. Just for coding simplicity, all of these things, in fact, do descend from or implement a higher level node construct. Okay, what can a node in DOM have and what do you need to bear in mind? Well, the fact that all of these types of nodes ultimately descend from the notion of one node is useful programmatically because it means you can recurse on nodes fairly nicely, you can in, uh, inspect a node and say what is your type and then act accordingly, and it generally is a useful thing. You don't have to worry about typing so much because everything is of type node. But what does a node have? Well, a node, every node, every node has a name, a value, a list of children, and a list of attributes. But for better or for worse, certain subtypes of nodes should not use some of those fields. So it's a trade-off in terms of design. Every node in the tree, whether it's an atter, a comment, an element node, a document node, all of them in Java speak are objects that have these fields, these member variables. But only some of those types of nodes should actually use those fields. For instance, what type of node that we've seen from the list earlier makes intuitive sense that it should have a name. An elements got a name. What is an example of one that just intuitively shouldn't really have a name per se? Comments don't have names. Documents don't really have names. They're a document element. Processing instructions. So those have names. It was question mark, name, space, value. So. The rest you can sort of reason through. A child list certainly makes sense for document nodes, element nodes, but not for text nodes, atter nodes, comment nodes. So there, too, it's perhaps overkill in that we've modeled everything as the same type of node. But again, it's sort of a trade-off, such as the way it's defined. Um, fortunately, there's actually a fifth field that you do get, which is the parent node. And one of the curious things in the little XML trivia, but that is actually useful programmatically. Attributes have parents, which are elements. Elements do not have attributes as children. So it's sort of a unidirectional relationship that you should bear in mind. And this becomes somewhat useful when we get to XPath. Next week and the following week, XPath is a sort of quick and dirty query language that you will use in XSLT. And it's useful to know that from an attribute, you can get to the element by way of its parent. But that doesn't mean from an element, you can get to its attributes by way of its children. You have to get at them via this list of attributes, not the list of children. So such is the reality. Um,
Finally, what does the DOM API itself do? Well, the kinds of methods that you get with the DOM API are kinds of the ones you would expect, like a method like get children or get attributes. It really models things in a fairly simple, fairly intuitive way, where if you're at some node in your tree and you want all of the relevant information, not only can you get the node's name and value, if any exist, if they don't exist, you'll just get back null. It won't throw an exception and so forth, so that can be useful. Right, your code will work so long as you're checking for nulls, but you can also get children and attributes, and you can add elements, you can add children, you can add attributes and so forth. And we'll see this in a uh, more concrete form in a couple of our examples. So know that, um, again, the W3C, DOM, the recommendation, defines things at a very high level. Um, in the implementation that Java gives us, JAXP, all of these interfaces happen to be in org.w3c.dom, which is to say if we pulled up the Java doc right now for JAXP, surfed on over to org.w3c.dom, we would see the following. So again, the course website's resources page is perhaps the first place you should stop when looking for such things. I'm in the JAXP API linked on our resources page, scrolling down to org.w3c.dom, and notice in the left-hand side here, or now in the middle, the types of interfaces you get, some of which should now look familiar. Atter, comment, document, node. Node list, it turns out, is the types of objects that we'll use to actually string together a node's children. It'll be implemented by way of a linked list, and that's how Java. Um, took its approach, um, text nodes and so forth. So because these are all defined in JAXP as interfaces, this is why there exist things like Xerces, that is reference implementations that actually go and implement these interfaces with specific class names that fortunately we tend not to have to worry about. So that is to say, in Java, you can program against this. That is to say, when you instantiate or de uh, declare a reference to one of these nodes, you declare it against the much more general interface. You should not, in almost all circumstances, start coding against your specific choice of parser or your specific choice of implementation of these EP APIs, which in Xerxes' case is this. And just a quick sanity check, why? Why preach the programming against these interfaces as opposed to the implementations? Yeah, exactly. You can pull out the implementation. That was the whole point of dwelling last week for a bit on the idea of factories and the idea of being able to choose your parser and just plug it in by way of your class path, for instance. It's just a useful thing. If you find one that's better performing, if you find one that's more correct, or quite simply, if Apache decides to change the class structure, your code itself won't break if you define it in this way. So just to be clear, in our first XML parser for project one, so we don't use the DOM interfaces from the W3 C. We, why? We're trying to make, give you a simplified interface, but we borrow from the spirit of that API and really let you focus on the most interesting stuff. And we also simplified the uh, idea of implementation by just using a node that's a class. And we have things descend from that rather than implement interfaces, which is a better way to implement an actual implementation. But for our purposes, it just increases the number of files and the numbers of lines of code without really being any more enlightening. And besides, we transition you in project one to the actual APIs where you get precisely that design. So let's, before diving into some of the demos, why don't we just quickly enumerate um, the most perhaps commonly used or most useful types of nodes to be aware of, and then we'll transition to the code itself. And you'll actually see these things in use and answer the more interesting question of what can you do with it. So a document has, um, this is not to be uh, reminded, the root element of the document, uh, the root element of the document, but it is the root now of your DOM. It can have children, that is content, at the top level of the document, like PIs and comments, as well as the root element. And it also itself contains functions for creating other types of DOM nodes. And this is true in the world of AJAX and JavaScript. If, you, if you're familiar with JavaScript and some um, client-side web programming, if you call something like document.getElementById, in JavaScript, if you've ever seen that call, that's effectively a DOM call, where document is the uh, variable, the reference that JavaScript gives you that gives you access to the entire web page, and calling its method get, elements by, get element by ID 
allows you to dive into the XML tree that effectively is a XHTML web page and get the types of nodes that you want. So realize that though we sort of officially focus on the Java world of things, almost all of this translates into other contexts as well, fairly easily, and that's because things are defined at this relatively high level. Element, dare say it's the most interesting thing in the DOM because just so much happens in the context of elements and there are some additional methods like adding attributes and so forth that obviously come with the element interface. An atter object, not to be confused with attribute or attributes, is DOM's name for a node that stores an attribute. And an attribute has a name and value. So good thing that every node has a name and value, but it doesn't have children, which means if you called get children on an attributes object, wouldn't throw a reference, your code wouldn't crash, you'd get back null, at least in the world of Java. That's the value of having everything inherit from each other, or that's the result. Um, dot, dot, dot. So what else is there? C data section, as you may have glimpsed in the Java doc, and the real API is another type of node. Comment processing instruction, as well as text. And these are all pretty simple, pretty straightforward types of nodes that do use, in this case, or can use, in this case, the name and value fields um, that are provided by every node. Okay, so any questions on this fairly high-level overview of what it means to be DOM? Yeah? All right, so let's take a look at a specific example. So again, we saw a demo or two last week in the context of JAXP 1.3 and Xerxes 2.71, but we only looked at Xerxes and JAXP's um, API, uh, SACS API half. Tonight we'll look more at the DOM half, which together constitute much of the functionality of JAXP, though also in JAXP is what's called tracks. And on the next two, in the next two weeks, we'll be focused on tracks, the transformation API for XML in terms of XSLT and XPath among other things. So I just enumerated here three of the packages or classes that we'll be using in these demos just to give you some visual familiarity with the types of uh, APIs that you would yourself be using. What I'm going to do is go into our examples three directory from tonight um, and a uh, printout of which was supplied on your way in. I moved these files into my own project one directory which isn't just the imp uh, isn't just the distribution code, but is also a solution to Project One because I want to actually have some working code because one of our demos tonight assumes that you have a working Project One. So you can yourself use this in a few days' time. The first example that we have here is DOM Builder Demo Java. So notice at top we are importing CSCIE 259.project1.mf. That is to say, this demo assumes that you have a working Project One. And specifically, we're going to use some other Java um, classes and such here. So what does this DOM builder demo do? Well, let's answer that by way of demonstration. If I go ahead and run DOM builder demo, so I get an exception because I don't do much error checking, which is fine because we're focusing on different aspects of this tonight. But what it's expecting is the name of a file, which I'll give it items.xml. What is items.xml? It's just this file. Pretty simple, pretty silly, but what's somewhat interesting about it is that it has like-named elements nested inside the same. So this is sort of a curious thing because if you just called blindly, get me all of the item elements, that might not be what you want because at least here, maybe it's bad design, but it's at least an interesting corner case to consider what kinds of things should we be aware of if you do have an, item, an element like item nested inside one like item, but they perhaps mean conceptually different things. Just what kinks does that put uh, in front of us? Well, what this program is going to do is quite simply the following. All this DOM builder does is it counts, apparently, the number of elements in the DOM that results from items.xml, and it counts the number of text nodes. But it does so using my or your implementation of DOM in project one. So recall in project one, there's a whole bunch of source code in this MF directory, uh, about half of which you've been using for the SACS part of project one, but there's a few classes that you may not have focused so much on yet, which include things like atter, which should make a little more sense tonight. Attributes, were, what was this from again? Just to distinguish? 
That was SAC. So start element recall in our simplified form takes two parameters. One is the name of the element and one is in reference to an attributes object. Well, that's what this guy was, not to be confused with Atter, which is for DOM. Document is clearly now relevant. DOM Walker is one of the pieces of code we give you that allows you to walk node by node a DOM once you've constructed it. Element should be self-explanatory now. Text, node, and then XML parser itself is going to be the parser you use in Project 1 to also build your DOM node. Just to get a sense of what's in here, what's node.java? Well, it's a class, it's abstract, because you can't just have a node per se in a DOM, you have to have types of nodes in a DOM. What does our implementation of node have? Well, it looks like it has children, and that makes sense, a name, a parent, and a value, and also some constants defined that allow us to do some kind of introspection and ask a node of some unknown type, what is your type? Presumably it will return one of these values, which helps us determine exactly what we're dealing with. And it looks like our implementation of node has append child, get child nodes, get node name, get node type, get node value, get parent node, set node name, and set node value. So pretty much getters and setters for those very basic of fields, name, value, attributes, children, and so forth though not necessarily attributes quite yet, as you may recall from Project One's goal. So, with that said, DOM Builder is your code per the spec that's ultimately going to have you, I won't show you too much of this since this is from a former student, uh, Bob Melvin. Uh, if I scroll down further, you'll see a wonderful implementation of attributes as it relates to DOM building. But in DOM Builder, recall, there will soon be code that has you building out of SACS events by way of this content handler or default handler, the DOM, the type of DOM we've been talking about tonight. So assume for now and take on faith that Bob did a very good job with his implementation. So I've installed it into this project one, 7.0 directory. And now I'm going to run again DOM builder demo dot Java on items.xml. And if Bob's implementation is correct, what this means is that his DOM code built for me a DOM which I then used to recurse over and count these types of elements. Well, let's see how this code operates. DOM builder demo.java, which is what I just ran, is this. Looks like I've got a couple variables to keep count, so pretty uninteresting, but important, necessary. Here's the main routine. So it grabs without, and as a leap of faith, this is why I got that exception initially when I didn't give it a file name, just assumes there's going to be a file name there. What does it then do? It instantiates an XML parser, Bob's, or really Project One's. It then instantiates a DOM builder, which again is that content handler, aka default handler, that's supposed to build a DOM out of SACS events. And then that's it. In three lines of code, once you have a working Project One, should you be able to parse an XML document, build a DOM out of it, in just these three steps. Okay? At this point in the story then, what do I have? Well, if I call DB, which is DOM builder get, uh, dot, get document, what that's defined to do in the code we give you is to return the root of your DOM. That is a reference to a document object, aka a node. So what that means at this point then in the story, I have a reference to the root of Bob's DOM. What I then do is instantiate uh, object of myself, which is con going to constitute the demo, and then I try quite simply this. This is pretty much the program. I try to call demo.visit, passing to this the so-called visit method the root of Bob's DOM. Well, all the rest of this is sort of for error handling and for an informative message at the end. So what does visit do? Visit's pretty simple. It's recursive, which is where its sort of power comes from. But what does it do? Visit takes as its sole argument a reference to a node, and this is good because it means we can sort of blindly recurse on all types of nodes, and if it's the wrong type of node, we can just return in our call stack by checking its type. So we switch on get node type, which you get for free with every type of node, and I check, is this node type of type node.text node? This is one of the constants we saw. If so, increment the counter. If it's instead a type of element, increment the counter. But and here's where it gets a little more interesting. If it is an element, it's got children or can have children. So I use our simplified API to get the child nodes, storing them as a list of children. 
I then use an iterator, you can do this in other ways, and I simply iterate over each of those children, each of which is a node, perhaps an element node, perhaps a comment node or something else, character node or text node, and I call visit on each of those nodes. And I do use a, a cast here just so that Java doesn't complain that it's getting a different type. And that's it. Otherwise I break if it's not either of those types, which means don't do anything, just return. So in the end, what I have is a little program that counts the number of text nodes and the number of element nodes in Bob's DOM. And certainly we could look at the code, the items.xml, and sort of on paper pencil figure out how many nodes of each type there should be. And you can do your own sort of sanity check on your own parser and your own DOM builder to see if your answer is indeed correct. But at the end of the day, the thing is that what you get with using an off-the-shelf parser is the root of that DOM, and then you can do interesting things with it. You don't need to do that kind of parsing yourself once you have access to these kinds of tools. So with that said, why don't we take a five minute break and we'll return with a couple more demos. So a quick word on these APIs, lest you get a little overwhelmed by their relative complexity vis-a-vis -vis our own simplified API that you've been using for Project One. All throughout, the real APIs are these mentions of namespaces. And you saw this last week when we looked at some of the SACS code where there's things like a queue name, a qualified name, and there were four, I believe, we saw um, parameters to the start element method in contrast to our simplified parser which just has two, the name and the attributes. We'll just realize that a lot of that complexity or some of that complexity derives from the real API support for what are called XML namespaces, a term which perhaps is familiar to you from other programming languages and so forth. For now I'm going to give a wave of the hand and say we're going to come back to this in a few weeks time and for now you can largely ignore those kinds of details and if you look for instance at the demos we used last week using the real API, pretty much I too in those demos ignored anything other than the queue name, which effectively just gave me the element name. So for now, you too, if you wish, can turn a blind eye. But the short of it, or a teaser, is that in XML, which, and this will be very useful when we get to XSLT and start intermingling languages together, including XHTML and XSLT in the same file, you want to be able to tease the two apart. And so XML allows you to tease apart two XML-based languages that are in the same file by way of namespace prefixes, which is essentially some key term colon, and then the element's name. So if you see things like that, just know that we'll tease that apart in due time. But for now, it, it's only a distraction, I think, not so much, uh, uh, not a, uh, not a, you're not missing out on anything by our waving our hands at it for now. All right, so now let's contextualize DOM, not just in, oh, I did that backwards. So now let's uh, remind ourselves that the demo I showed you a moment ago was with DOM Builder and not the real API. So what we're going to do is rewind now to what was to be the demo of the real API and we'll do that now. So the other demo that we've included tonight besides DOM Builder demo is Document Builder demo, which the similar name is unfortunately similar um, only because uh, the name is uh, consistent with some of the stuff in the actual API. So notice that because we're using the real API, now I'm including a whole bunch more stuff, but again, initially, as you write this kind of code, copy-paste is your friend, certainly, and using things like Eclipse, you'll even be told what's not even needed, and you can sort of learn just by inference what's relevant to the types of code you're writing, but a lot of it's sort of self-explanatory. You need documents, elements, nodes, if you're actually going to code against those in this file. So what does this particular demonstration do. So it too is going to be run on a XML file, but what this program is going to do is similarly recurse over the nodes in that document and it's going to, let's say, slash any prices it finds. So that is to say, recall the sample file we had a moment ago, items.xml, and notice we've got a widget, a big widget, some components in here, each of which has a price. The goal of this simple document builder demo is to build a DOM out of this document and then use the real DOM API to, so, so to speak, slash the prices in this document. That is, take the existing prices, create a new node in the document that has a sale price. Now the point of this isn't so much because it's interesting to play around with widgets and components and so forth, but because we'll actually see in this fairly short demo code exactly what kinds of manipulations you can perform on an existing DOM that you'll have built up out of your use of a real parser. 
So in document builder demo dot Java, up front, we just have uh, some lines of code, a little more rigorous this time, that check for usage and ensure that we've got at least the name of something on the command line. We grab the file name here, and then we just declare a reference to a document builder, which is the actual um, type of class that you would use in the real API to create a DOM. And what we're going to try to do is this. So we're going to get a document building parser. So just like last week we saw in our SACS demo, there was a SACS parser that would return to us um, a reference to a SAC. There was a SACS parser factory that would return to us a reference to a SAX parser. Tonight we're effectively getting back a DOM parser, but it happens to be called in JAXP a document builder. Okay? What we're going to do once we have this reference to a parser is use it to parse whatever file name was passed in at the command line. So quite simply I'm going to call parser.parse of input, where input again is the file name. By definition, what this DOM building code does, what document builder does in the real API, is it returns the root of the document, assuming the document was well formed and no fatal errors got triggered along the way. We'll get back the root of the document. After that, what are we going to do? We're going to instantiate this little demo, as we've done before, and then we're going to call the, this demos slash prices method on the root of the document. So in structure, this demo is almost identical, certainly identical in spirit to the demo we did a moment ago with Bob's implementation of DOM from project one. The difference fundamentally here is that now we're using the real JAXP API to parse the same file. We're doing something different with the file, this time slashing prices, but we are similarly calling some method, not just visit, but rather slash prices on the root of the DOM. And the beauty of this is that now we didn't have to do the parsing of that document or the building of the DOM, all we do is call one line of code and we're handed a DOM. Just as a browser, again, in the world of Ajax or JavaScript would hand you the whole document node to then manipulate. So what are we then going to do? Well, after we slash prices, this is a destructive routine, which as I hinted before, is going to create some new nodes in the document which constitute discounted prices in addition to the original prices. And now I just want to see the results, right? With a debugger, I could maybe walk through in memory after setting a breakpoint and figure out what new nodes have been created. We're playing with XML. It's human readable. What I'm instead going to do is instantiate one of these XML serializers with which you're familiar already from last week. And I'm just going to serialize the altered DOM. And by altered, I mean the original DOM plus the new nodes that constitute the discounted prices. And that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a good question. If you only really care about a subset of the DOM and there, a subset of a document, and therefore just want one big branch of the tree, one subtree, if you will, what the DOM API really allows you to do is parse the whole document. So you could get the document, then find the subnode you're interested in, and just hang on to it, and leave it to Java's garbage collection to get rid of the rest. Odds are you wouldn't get rid of much, though, because of the dual pointers for parent nodes and so forth. You still have active references. But you could do that. Alternatively, if you knew this XML document, if you knew you only wanted a subset of the document, you could do some pre-processing on the document and only pass to the DOM builder the node beneath who, which you care about. And you could do it that way, too, by just doing you know, pattern matching and just grab a subset of the document itself. So both ways, but you're either going to get with DOM back, the, you're going to get back everything that you, asked, uh, that you handed it in the form of a DOM. So I'm going to delay the revelation of what the slash prices routine does just so that we can set some expectations. If I run document, building de document builder demo on items.xml, notice that I get back same file, but with the addition of an attribute. So the types of nodes being inserted into the DOM turn out to be attribute nodes. So they're being attached laterally to the elements called price. But notice I have the original price and then some kind of discounted price by some percentage. 
So that's it. So just to summarize, document builder demo parses items.xml and builds of it from it a DOM. I then take that DOM's root at node, the document node, and pass it to my slash prices routine. It's destructive because it changes the DOM somehow. I pass that altered DOM to a serializer, which whose sole purpose in life, again, is to flatten an XML uh, structure and make it XML formatted again. And then we see the result. So how does slash prices work? And to be clear, it's in slash prices that we really see some of these DOM manipulating routines. Well, slash prices takes, as its argument, a reference to an element. And that makes sense because, oh, I should be clear on what I passed. I didn't pass the root of the document. Notice that in stupid naming schemes, doc, recall, is the reference to the root of the document, is the document node. Document nodes, by definition in the API, have a method called get document element, which should have been called get root element. Okay? Stupid decision somewhere along the way. Perhaps with justification, none that I'm familiar with. So just realize it's somewhat confusing. Doc is the document node. Get document element gets the root element that is one layer beneath the, um, beneath the document node. So with that said, what is passed to slash prices is indeed an element, the root element, the first time it's called. Well, what do we do? And again, real API code ahead. So I call element.getChildNodes. Turns out you've seen that before in our simplified API, right? We borrowed the naming schemes as best we could. We get back what's called a node list. So this is an actual data type, whereas in our simplified form, we just used a Java list. Well, if you're using the real API, you're using a node list and it has its own methods associated with it. I'm going to iterate over those children in a fairly typical way. I'm going to, for each node, I'm going to get its, uh, for, um, for each child, I'm going to grab a reference there too, calling it n for node. And I'm then going to just check what type of node this is. And if this is not an element node, I'm just going to continue with the next child because uh, the goal here is to update prices, prices, or that is price elements are elements, so I don't care about any other type of node other than elements, so I'm just going to continue if it's not an element. If it is an element, I'm going to proceed and check you know, what's the name of this element, because there's some other elements in that document, like name and so forth. What is the real name of this element? And if it's price, then I care about it. Then I found something of interest, so I'm going to compute a double, which is 80% of the current ch child's first child's value as a double. Okay, scary code ahead. Let's tease this apart. So n is a node, in this case an element. Elements can have children, but I thought we were already dealing with children here, right? Because n itself is one of the children of the node that was passed into this method. So why are we taking that child, which turns out to be an element called price, and calling it get first child method. What does that mean? Perfect. So recall that text in an XML document, when represented in a DOM, itself is stored in a node. So if you think back to one of our representative documents earlier, any of the actual text in that document was stored in a text node, which was the child of, typically, an element node. So if this is an element node n, and we want what we would intuitively think of its value, that is the price, well, we get its first child, which, if it exists, is going to be a price. And again, slight leap of faith here, because if there is no child node, if there's no price in the file for whatever reason, then this could trigger a dereferencing of null, which could be bad once we get to this point, if there is no child node. But again, we're trying to keep the distractions to a minimum for now, and we can assume that someone else validated the document anyway in advance. So once I have that first child, which is presumably its only child, a price, I get its node value. Turns out that text nodes, they do officially have names and values, but they only use the latter field, value. So if you want to get at the character content of a text node, you take that text node's value, which is precisely what we do here. And then finally, just so that we get the job of mathematics right, we then cast this thing to a double, or we convert this thing to a double. This is a way of taking, if you're not familiar, the double method. This is the constructor for the double class, which allows us to pass in a string, which effectively a string just happens to be a double, so that gives us a double object. This gives us back a double value, which means I can store it in a primitive.
long line of code. Finally, I'm using this decimal format class just to massage things into a pretty format. And notice, though, this line of code is the more interesting one. I'm taking n and casting it to an element. The reason I did that is because the children are returned as references to nodes more generally, so I'm more concretely casting this to an element. You can do this in different ways, but only for elements is it valid to call set attribute. Right? Nodes themselves don't necessarily have attributes. Elements do. I'm going to set the attribute called sale price to be this nicely formatted new price. And what this line effectively does then is it creates a new atter object for this node, storing this name and that value. And finally, we have to recurse. So if this is in fact an element, which it is because I did a check here, then I'm going to recurse on this element's children, if any. And through that recursive process, what you again go from is items.xml, which look like that, to the resulting file, which is identical except for the introduction of the sale price attributes. Silly example in and of itself. You can imagine this being useful, though, if you want to massage an XML document, add some data to it, or so forth. But the real takeaway and the intended takeaway is what kinds of API calls exist in the DOM interface. And there are certainly others. For instance, if we wanted to know what you could do with an element, well, you know in the SACS API, we could have simply pulled up the element interface and notice that not only is there a routine like set attribute, which I did use. We can also do things like get attribute. Um, and a lot of this is namespace. So I'm skipping through this because a lot of it is just a distraction for now. But notice that even though there are some element specific methods in the API, like setting of attributes, notice that inherited from the more generic node, you get all the more obvious methods that you would expect, like appending a child or getting the node's type and value, getting the last child and so forth. But one of the things you should realize with DOM is that even though it's a complete model for XML, not necessarily the most efficient. And so off-the-shelf tools won't necessarily use DOM itself for a variety of reasons, one of which might be the following. How, again, are children of elements represented? Have we seen? So they're represented as node lists, which turn out to be little more than linked lists. Consider a node, then, that has many children. Conceptually, we might draw that with a whole bunch of branches descending, an inary tree. Really, what DOM does for an element's children is if it's got all these children here and so forth, really, DOM does not technically give you this relationship with an edge from the parent to every one of those children. What's it really giving you, so far as we can tell? Right. And as you saw, get last node, I think, you can also get to the last element. Uh, references to nodes, yes, in a node list. Or it, it, it stores a node list effectively. So just realize, and so for performance reason, though DOM is useful, and certainly in the context of, say, web development and JavaScript, where at the end of the day, you're not talking about huge documents anyway, not necessarily a huge deal, especially since the document element itself gives you the ability to grab arbitrary elements by way of document.getElement by ID and so forth. But just realize that that is sort of the reality of the API. Okay, questions? Okay, so my first parser, where does that leave you? So last week you pretty much had the the material by which to bite off all things related to SAC. Certainly after tonight, you should feel at least familiar with the types of material covered by the DOM aspect of the project. And that pretty much rounds out project one. A couple of comments. One, what does it take to actually submit the project? Well, simply following the you know, 20 some odd page specification pretty much gets you home by the last page telling you how to submit. But just so that you see it once, once you have, if you've never, I'll do this on camera once, if you have 
a PC, you're likely using a program like uh, SecureFX or any other SFTP program to upload your files to nice.fas.harvard.edu. You're going to log in with your FAS username and password, which you should have had a couple of weeks ago already. The interface in this program happens to look like this, but it's essentially like an FTP program. And the project tells you what directory structure you should maintain in your home directory so that the right files do get submitted. Let's assume you've done that and uploaded your files and we certainly assume in this course that you have some familiarity with or some friends with familiarity with SFTP or FTP so that you can get your files up to the server if you've been developing on your own computer. If you then use a program like Secure CRT or any SSH program, PuTTY and so forth, you'll get to a blinking prompt eventually which if you've configured your account per project one will give you your username at whatever specific host you're on. I'm going to change into my CSCIE 259 directory and into my project one directory and as the project instructs you're going to run CSCIE 259 submit project one and if you did it correctly and everything's where it should be you should get a nice clear message like this saying your work has or has not been submitted and also just email to me and eventually you will be a printed listing of every file and its size that was submitted to us so there is no way that one can be confused as to what he or she submitted um, and we also timestamp things so as as you should expect certainly take care to submit before the deadline since there are exponentially increasing Penalty, penalties for submitting late, even if it's past the minute mark and so forth. It's all automated. So, a sneak preview then of next week. As I mentioned in an email this morning, what I've gone ahead and done already, as if project one were perhaps not enough work for you already, is posted project two on the course's website. And rest assured, if you're, if you're already sold on the course and you're sticking with us anyway, don't look at this thing for another week or so, lest you get overwhelmed. Um, this, this isn't even the project per se. This is a PDF from London's uh, transit system. And among the things you'll be doing in project two is, believe it or not, implementing this. It's not gonna look as pretty, but long story short, we're going to give you a file called xtube.xml, which is a couple hundred kilobytes. In this file is XML markup containing the names of all of the train lines and train stations, the colors thereof, the logos thereof, the geographic coordinates thereof, of pretty much everything in central London that relates to the tube, trams, and trains. So this whole transit system of which this PDF is a depiction thereof. What you'll be doing with that file, among other things, is one, presenting us, developing for us using XSLT, a sort of web-based navigation tool, pretty simple, all within the confines of one page, maybe with fragment IDs that let the user jump around, that essentially presents this data in some way largely of your own design that allows a user like me to visit it and figure out, all right, if I'm at uh, Piccadilly Circus in central London, where can I connect to from there? What tube lines go through Piccadilly Circus? And essentially answer questions of that form but just using a single web page. We're not going to be using server-side software just yet. The second part of that aspect of the project is to take that same data and generate a graphical depiction of the tube. And it's not going to look as pretty because we give you the true geographic coordinates. If you actually overlay this on the city of London, London does not look like that. Everything is kind of distorted and smushed, kind of like the MBTA's map is, though London's even more so is altered for readability. And what you'll be using is a language called SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, and we'll charge you with uh, outputting colored lines and colored circles, each of which represent a stop on the tubes, trains, or trams, and all of the lines are the edges between those stations. And there's a couple other smaller aspects of the project. You, the project itself sort of holds your hand from a fairly simple example involving XSLT to a more interesting one involving blockbuster movies to the end game, which is Xtube itself. And it's so much fun. And the upside of attending in person next week will be that you get a nice printed 17 by 11 inch uh, glossy copy of this map. And it's sort of a fun thing, I think, actually, to be sitting there working on a project when it's actually real data. The kinds of questions you're going to be asking yourself is, where the hell is Piccadilly Circus? And you'll be able to look that up on the map. And the upside of these PDFs is that with Control F, you can start searching for things. And Control F will become your friend if Piccadilly Circus is up here when it's really supposed to be down here. So just a teaser for next week. And we'll be moving away for Java for two or three weeks as we focus on XPath, XSLT, SVG, and more. So with that said, let's officially conclude. We'll see you next week.